know you. You're that jaywalking punk anarchist. You're that jaywalking punk anarchist. Jaywalking punk anarchist. Why is it always cats? Gummo and the Great Cat Massacre. Hello, this is the Radical Reviewer taking a look at... Seriously, why is it always cats? Okay, okay, okay. This is a look at Gummo, the 1997 film by Harmony Corinne, and The Great Cat Massacre, the 1984 book by Robert Darnton. First, before we go any further, a warning. This video is going to be full of A, spoilers for the film Gummo, and the book The Great Cat Massacre, and a few light spoilers for related books and films. But more importantly, B, content warning, for incredibly graphic imagery, both descriptive and visual. So, heads up on that. With all that said, it's story time. The story of the Great Cat Massacre. The worker, Nicholas Cantant, told the story in an account of his apprenticeship in the shop, Rue saint Severin, Paris, during the late 1730s. Life as an apprentice was hard, he explained. There were two of them. Jerome, a somewhat fictionalized version of Cantant himself, and Laville. They slept in a filthy, freezing room, rose before dawn, ran errands all day while dodging insults from the journeyman and abuse from the master, and received nothing but slop to eat. They found the food especially galling. Instead of dining at the master's table, they had to eat scraps from his plate in the kitchen. Worse still, the cook secretly sold the leftovers and gave the boys cat food, old rotten bits of meat that they could not stomach, and so passed on to the cats who would refuse it. This last injustice brought Cantat to the theme of cats. They occupied a special place in his narrative and in the household of the Rue saint Severin. The master's wife adored them, especially La Gris, the Grey, her favorite. A passion for cats seemed to have swept through the printing trade, at least at the level of masters, or the bourgeois as the workers called them. One bourgeois kept 25 cats, he had their portraits painted, and fed them on roast fowl. Meanwhile, the apprentices were trying to cope with the profusion of alley cats, who also thrived in the printing district, and made the boys' lives miserable. The cats howled all night on the roof over the apprentice's dingy bedroom, making it impossible to get a full night's sleep. As Jerome and Laville had to stagger out of bed at 4 or 5 in the morning to open the gate for the earliest arrivals among the journeymen, they began the day in a state of exhaustion while the bourgeois slept late. The master did not even work with the men, just as he did not eat with them. He let the foreman run the shop and rarely appeared in it except to vent his violent temper, usually at the expense of the apprentices. One night, the boys resolved to right this inequitable state of affairs. Laville, who had an extraordinary talent for mimicry, crawled along the roof until he reached a section near the master's bedroom. And then he took to howling and mewing so horribly that the bourgeois and his wife did not sleep a wink. After several nights of this treatment, they decided they were being bewitched. But instead of calling the cure, asking for religious aid against the witchcraft, the master was exceptionally devout and the mistress exceptionally attached to her confessor, referring to the rumor that the mistress was sleeping with the local religious leader. They commanded the apprentices to get rid of the cats, the mistress gave the order, enjoying the men, above all, to avoid frightening her grease. Gleefully, Jerome and Laville set to work, aided by the journeymen. Armed with broom handles, bars of press, and other tools of their trade, they went after every cat they could find, beginning with La Grise. Laville smashed its spine with an iron bar, and Jerome finished it off. Then they stashed it in the gutter, while the journeymen drove the other cats across the rooftops, bludgeoning everyone within reach and trapping those who tried to escape in strategically placed sacks. They dumped the sack loads of half-dead cats in the courtyard. Then the entire workshop gathered around and staged a mock trial, complete with guards, a confessor, and a public executioner. After pronouncing the animals guilty and administering last rites, they strung them up on improvised gallows. Roused by gales of laughter, the mistress arrived. She let out a shriek as soon as she saw a bloody cat dangling from a noose. Then she realized it might be La Grise. Certainly not, the men assured her. They had too much respect for the house to do such a thing. At this point, the master appeared, 
he flew into a rage at the general stoppage of work. Though his wife tried to explain that they were threatened by a more serious kind of insubordination. Then the master and mistress withdrew, leaving the men delirious with joy, disorder, and laughter. Okay, killing cats is a celebration? That sounds incredibly bizarre, doesn't it? Were these people possessed? What was wrong with them? Well, before we go any further, here are the key questions I'd like to address in this video. One, how does the cat function as a metaphor for sexuality? And two, why killing? Well, it turns out humans actually have a rich history of celebratory cat killing. As Darnton explains it, cats played an important part in some chavaris. In Burgundy, the crowd incorporated cat torture into its rough music. While mocking a cuckold or some other victim, the youths passed around a cat, tearing its fur to make it howl. Fer le chat, they called it. The Germans called the chavaris Katzenmusik, a term that may have been derived from the howling of the tortured cats. Darnton continues, at the time of the summer solstice, crowds made bonfires, jumped over them, danced around them, and threw into them objects with magical power, hoping to avoid disaster and obtain good fortune during the rest of the year. A favorite object was cats. Cats tied up in bags, cats suspended from ropes, or cats burned at the stake. Parisians liked to incinerate cats by the sackful, while courmades, cour et mal, par pardon my French, or cat chasers of Saint Germain preferred to chase a flaming cat through the streets. In parts of Burgundy and Lorraine, they danced around a kind of burning maypole with a cat tied to it. In the Metz region, they burned a dozen cats at a time in a basket on top of a bonfire. And according to Darnton, cats are even associated with economic turmoil. Cats possessed a occult power independently of their association with witchcraft and deviltry. They could prevent the bread from rising if they entered a bakery in Anjou. They could spoil the catch if they crossed the path of a fisherman in Brittany. If burned alive in Berne, they could clear a field of weeds. Okay, but this is all about pre-revolutionary France. That was hundreds of years ago. Well, I suppose from here it only makes sense to discuss a story from the late 20th century in Xenia, Ohio. The film, Gummo. As you well know, Gummo is a jumbled hodgepodge of graphic, sad, extreme scenes of youth in dilapidated Rust Belt America. A story of kids with no adult supervision, much like the movie Kids or Spring Breakers, or books like Lord of the Flies. Oh, you've never heard of Gummo. Or maybe some of you have. Well, for most people, Gummo is a film they've never heard of, but for those who know it, it's a bizarre jumbled mess. The writer and director, Harmony Crin, even described the movie as not having main characters. It's filmed primarily in unaltered houses and neighborhoods, and has no structured plot. He was attempting to make a movie that reflects real life, where there are no main characters and no plot structure. However, I believe there is a main character, and that main character is Foot Foot, the house cat. Let's take a look at the film with a focus on the themes of sex, decay, gender, and the killing of cats. I can't believe I said that sentence out loud. God, I love the internet. Okay. The film intros with a little girl stating, Larry has a pussy, and Jay has a pussy, and Jay has a pussy, and Mommy has a pussy, and Aunt Leo has a little tiny pussy. Right off the bat, themes of sexuality and gender. And then we get a voiceover from the character Solomon, who explains that the town Xenia, Ohio, was hit with a tornado, and many mothers and fathers were killed in the disaster. And Solomon concludes, I saw a girl fly through the sky, and I looked up her skirt. Again, themes of sexuality as well as themes of destruction. And this cuts right to, We're then introduced to who most people probably consider the main characters of the film. The younger one is Solomon and the older one is Tumblr. 
And then we meet who I consider the main character, the cat Foot Foot. You got this one? Yep. Don't kill it, bitch. It's a house cat. It's a lesbian cat. You can tell. Looks like my mom. Then we meet three female characters, Darby, Dot, and Helen, who check to see if Foot Foot is pregnant. Oh, is Darby's She's oh. looking a little impregnated. Yeah. She is. Let's flip her over and look at her bomb in private. Let me look at you, Foot Foot. Is it red? It's not any red, no. Is it swollen? No. An impregnated cat is a bitch, but this cat's pregnant. Yeah. Two. No, she's not a bitch. She is too. She's getting herself in trouble like this. She still has nine nips. Nine nips? Nine lives too. If she is pregnant, we'll have to drown the kittens in the creek. We then cut to Solomon and Tumblr filling a garbage bag with dead cats. If you can't tell, this film has themes of cat killing, decay, and sexual discovery. We then see the two boys selling their bag of cats to a local shop owner. And a lot of interesting things happen here. For example, the guy buying the cats holds up the scale to rip the kids off. He then says he's selling the cats to a restaurant which is going out of business, and he then rats out another kid who has been killing cats. But there are two very important things to note here. One, the killing of cats is always framed as the kids having no supervision and nothing better to do, rather than leaning on some tired trope about satanic rituals or something. And two, the kids use the money from the cats to buy glue to get high. When we see Solomon and Tumblr huff glue, the following conversation occurs. Uh, my brother is crying. Where is he now? My brother? Yeah. He's in a big city. He took off in a bus. Yeah? He's a queer. He's a queer now. Your brother is? Yeah, he, he dressed like ladies. He wears skirts and lipsticks. He wears stockings, eyeliner. He has boobs. Uh -huh. Very much. Was he pretty? I don't know. I guess so. I guess he was pretty. Pretty not to have a boyfriend. Psst. This film is full of themes of cat killing, decay, and sexual discovery. Now, there's a character named Bunny Boy who I haven't brought up yet, mainly because he doesn't say anything in the movie, and so there's only two times in the film that he's relevant for the discussion at hand. Uh, one of those times is right here, where Bunny Boy plays dead while two young boys yell homophobic and sexist slurs at him. I bring this up because it's another example of the film displaying unsupervised children acting out in regards to gender and sexuality. We then see Solomon and Tumblr confront the other kid who's been killing cats. He says he's been doing it for three weeks, and he explains that he takes care of his 90-year-old catatonic grandmother. So now you just take care of your granny. Yeah. Kill cats too. Yeah. These are the kids of this town. No supervision, no constructive outlets. The boys then go into a house, and a guy with no shirt opens the door. We find out he's selling his sister as a prostitute. You bought my money? Yeah. Good. Right. Come on, let's go in the house. Come on. Oh, man. I gotta tell you, she had a migraine headache earlier today. And she almost wanted to call the whole thing off, okay? okay. But I gave her I gave her some aspirin. Cool. Hey, thanks a lot. Make sure. I'm gonna go fuck her now. Well, you wanna fuck her? Yeah. Well, you gonna fuck her too? Yeah. The guy also peeps in on Tumblr and his sister having sex. If this interests you, Crin did another film called Trash Humpers about a gang of elderly people who enjoy having sex with garbage. Then Solomon goes into the room, and it's revealed that the prostituted sister is mentally handicapped. 
She asks Solomon, Are you clean? Do you soap? Let me smell your wrist. It smells good. How's it smell like? Like fruit, like cherries. My mom gives me cherry shampoo. I like cherries. I put cherries in my ice cream. I like the name of Cherry Cherries. You got hands like a girl? No, I don't. <laughs> yes, you do. Again, themes of sexuality and gender discovery. This scene of sexual debauchery is immediately followed by... <laughs> In a sort of Kuleshov effect way, we directly compare the debauchery of gender and sexual discovery with the debauchery of killing cats. But what does it mean? This is followed by seeing Solomon and Tumblr's home lives. We see Solomon working out with makeshift dumbbells in a dilapidated basement. His mother comes down and talks about his dead father, and she concludes, Come on, can you smile for me, please? You son of a bitch, if you don't smile, I'm gonna kill you, okay? I've killed before and I will kill again. I will pick up your brains all over the floor. You came out of my womb and I'll stick you right back in my womb. If you don't smile, I'm going to kill you. And with Tumblr, we see him and his dad heading to a party. Tumblr asks if he looks like his mother, who has passed away. And his father explains that the man who raised him had a wife who would walk around in her underwear and that he and the other boys were instructed not to touch her. We then see Tumblr and his dad at the party. For whatever reason, I really like this scene, perhaps because it reminds me of parties at my dad's house growing up. Slap boxing, rock and roll, drinking beers, late 80s, early 90s, working class aesthetic. In this scene, we see Tumblr beat his dad at arm wrestling and also a man with dwarfism beating the biggest man in the room in arm wrestling. These challenges to masculinity are met with mockery. Don't you know it's a sin to get beat by your son? Say shoot, shoot, shoot. He got beat, he got beat, he got beat by his own son. He got beat, he got beat, he got beat by his own son. And Tumblr is instructed to beat up a chair by the other adults who yell. There you go, there you go. Hey. You're in the head. Hey, 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 you're in the brain. Finish that. There you go, say Here, Tumblr is shown to be nurtured in an environment of macho insecurity, gender conformity, and violence. So, both Solomon and Tumblr come from single parent households where there was a death of one of the parents. We're then treated to more displays of dilapidation and poor supervision, as a young boy moves pictures on a wall and bugs crawl out from behind it. The boy has bites all over his legs and black teeth. Solomon and Tumblr are sitting there on a couch with another kid and they're all doing whippets. We then see Solomon and Tumblr wearing masks of women's faces and wielding weapons and breaking into a house. We discover they planned on beating up the other boy who'd been killing cats but he isn't there. Solomon steals a pair of socks and replaces his own filthy socks. He then finds photos of the boy in makeup and women's clothing, and a stack of porno magazines including gay porn. More themes of youth discovering sex and gender exploration in a dilapidated society which lacks nurturing environments. Solomon and Tumblr walk into the room where the bedridden catatonic grandmother is. Tumblr brushes her hair and tells Solomon to shoot her in the foot with a BB gun. He does and there's no reaction. Then Tumblr turns off her life support and she dies. She's always been dead. She's been gone a long time. We then see Darby, Dot, and Helen handing out flyers for a lost cat. Our main character is missing. In case you forgot, remember Foot Foot the house cat's the main character? 
Solid black with green eyes. Yeah. I see one. I'll come back and tell you. Well, the number's on the, on the flyer. You can just call our number. Good. All right. Ask for Helen, Dot, or Darby. A man approaches and asks, Is this your cat? Yeah. The girls ride in the car with the middle-aged man. He seems like a city guy and talks about things the girls don't understand, such as celebrity gossip. He then takes the girls to a nearby storage facility. How much further is it to where you saw Foot Foot? It, it's right nearby here. It's right around here. Where? Well, I'm not sure exactly, but is there a map? There's a map in the glove box or here somewhere. Maybe it's under the seat down there. Let me... Let me see if I can I reach see it. no map around. Maybe I can reach it down What are you doing? Why are you trying to touch your coochie? I didn't do anything. Pervert? I'm just uh -huh. trying to touch your coochie. Get out of there, 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 Girls aren't yeah, brand new. Car. Just give me some. That's oh, all. For you. You're a hose anyway. It's no big deal. It's nothing new for Pervert. trash like you. Kiss my ass, nothing fucker. new for trash like you. Nothing new fucker. for trash oh, like fuck you. you asshole. Yeah. Baby. <laughs> fucking asshole. Idiot. Dilapidation and lack of supervision and nurturing environments has exposed these children to sexualization and abuse. This is followed by further exploring the dilapidation that Solomon lives under. He sits in a filthy bathtub. The house is totally hoarded. There's bacon taped to the wall. Solomon's hair is longest in the back as if it hasn't been cut since he was a baby. He gets a candy bar and drops it in the dirty bathtub. He eats the soggy candy bar and drinks milk while he has spaghetti sauce all over his face. There's dismembered Barbies hanging behind him. The whole scene is very disturbing. Later, we see Rabbit Boy making out with Darby and Dot in a swimming pool while it's pouring rain. Solomon and Tumblr are shown standing in the pouring rain and shooting a dead cat on the ground. They shoot it over and over and over again. Again, a juxtaposition of sexuality, decay, and the killing of cats. It then cuts to video of a tornado, just like the one that destroyed the town before our story began. As the film comes to a conclusion, Bunny Boy walks up to the camera to reveal that the cat that Solomon and Tumblr were shooting is Foot Foot, the girl's cat, the missing cat, the pregnant cat. So what's going on here? What's with the killing of cats? Well, when analyzing the Great Cat Massacre, Darnton makes an interesting observation. He states, Anthropologists have found that the best points of entry in an attempt to penetrate an alien culture can be those where it seems to be most opaque. When you realize that you are not getting something, a joke, a proverb, a ceremony, that is particularly meaningful to the natives, you can see where to grasp a foreign system of meaning in order to unravel it. So what does this mean for the Great Cat Massacre? What does it mean for Gummo? What does this mean for killing cats? Darnton explains the motivations of the 1730s print shop workers in this way. By executing the cats with such elaborate ceremony, they condemned the house and declared the bourgeois guilty. Guilty of overworking and underfeeding his apprentices. Guilty of living in luxury while his journeymen did all the work. Guilty of withdrawing from the shop and swapping it with allures instead of laboring and eating with the men, as masters were said to have done a generation or two earlier or in the primitive republic that existed at the beginning of the printing industry, the guilt extended from the boss to the house to the whole system. Perhaps in trying, confessing, and hanging a collection of half-dead cats, the workers meant to ridicule the entire legal and social order. Darnton continues, It would be absurd to view the cat massacre as a dress rehearsal for the September massacres of the French Revolution. But the earlier outburst of violence did suggest a popular rebellion, though it remained restricted to the level of symbolism. Okay, so what are the boys in Gummo lashing out against? Their lack of supervision? Their lack of nurturing? Are they representing their macho aggression in a dilapidated and decaying society? Are they struggling for exploration of their gender and sexuality? Well, all these are certainly key features of their frustration. 
The early 1730s, before the French Revolution, was a time of great turmoil, suffering, and uncertainty for poor workers, as the guillotines of the French Revolution certainly demonstrate. And the deindustrialization of the Rust Belt, which Ohio is smack dab in the middle of, is also an area of turmoil, suffering, and uncertainty, perhaps setting the groundwork for the guillotines of the future. Let's take a look at the key questions again, the ones I mentioned several minutes ago. 1. How does the cat function as a metaphor for sexuality? Let's look at a classic joke. Dogs want to play when you want to play, and dogs want to play when you don't want to play. Dogs are men in fur coats. Cats want to play when you don't want to play, and don't want to play when you do want to play. Cats are women in fur coats. Let's compare the killing of the cats to the trope kicking the dog. The kicking the dog trope takes place in several films. American Psycho, The Lobster, Snowtown Murders, Clockwork Orange? Does a dog get kicked in Clockwork Orange? I don't remember. Anyway, the trope serves as a shorthand to say, hey, this person is despicable. What is with this comparison of men to dogs and women to cats and the violence enacted against them? There is certainly some precedence for this. As Darnton argues, French folklore attaches special importance to the cat as a sexual metaphor, or metonym. For example, proverbial wisdom identified women with cats. He who takes good care of cats will have a pretty wife. In The Great Cat Massacre, Darnton describes the print shop story as having gendered elements. He describes the killing of Legris as an attack on the madam of the house and basically metaphorically killing her, as well as challenging her faithfulness to her husband. In Gummo, the pregnant cat Footfoot Foot is obviously female, but more important than that, being pregnant, she represents motherhood, which I'll address in just a second. Throughout the movie, it's only boys who are killing cats, the masculine destruction of the feminine. But not only this, we see that two characters in the film are perhaps transgender, Tumblr's older sibling and the kid with the canatonic grandmother. And also, motherhood is incredibly absent from the film. We never see the girls interact with a mother figure, and Tumblr's mother is dead, and even his father was raised motherless. And the other boy who's been killing cats was raised by a grandmother, who is killed in the movie. In fact, the only motherly moments we see in the whole film are Solomon's mom yelling at him, threatening to kill him, threatening to put him back inside her womb while holding a toy gun to his head, and the scene where she bathes and feeds him. Both of these scenes are highly symbolic, as well as highly disturbing. Both of these scenes have heavy Freudian overtones, such as returning to the womb, and the standard motherly acts of bathing and feeding, which are also tasks that mother cats do. Let's look at the second question. What's with the historical precedent of killing cats? It seems like this act is a celebration in response to repression and turmoil. In the book of Mice and Men, the killing of the mentally handicapped man Lenny is symbolic of the death of capitalism's ability to take care of the downtrodden, the oppressed, of those who need nurturing. Lenny's death symbolizes the death of the American dream. In the same way, the book The Lord of the Flies, the boys killing the pregnant pig symbolizes the death of the feminine, the death of a source of food, since the boys could have perhaps raised the piglets for food. It's the death of innocence, the death of the future, and in this same way, the boys killing Footfoot, Foot, the killing of the pregnant cat symbolizes the killing of the feminine, the killing of motherhood, the killing of nurturing, the killing of the future. It seems as though ecological collapse is on the horizon. How we address this collapse will be to the judgment of future generations. I don't suspect that the future will care if we did or didn't collaborate with Marxist-Leninists, or if we engaged in pacifist or violent protests. The future will not care if we were ideologically pure. The future will not care if we were the most correct about how it all ended. If the Great Cat Massacre and Gummo have taught us anything, it's that humanity has a long and sordid history of killing the feminine in times of turmoil and crisis. And if contemporary history has taught us anything, 
Gamergate, anti-feminism, the Me Too movement, transphobia, Trump's pussy grabbing, Kavanaugh's sexual assault charges, and the rise of red pill and incels and MGTOW and the men's rights activism. We live in a continuation of this sordid history, of the desire to murder the feminine in our time of chaotic economic and ecological uncertainty. As these reactionary forces seem poised on destroying the feminine and nurturing aspects in our society, it seems our future will heavily rely on embracing the feminine, embracing motherhood, embracing joy. Or as Darnton concluded, by seeing the way a joke worked in the horseplay of a printing shop two centuries ago, we may be able to recapture that missing element. Laughter. Sheer laughter. The thigh slapping, rib cracking, Rablazian kind, rather than the Voltarian smirk with which we are familiar. If you're interested in radical theory, Tell looking for a book recommendation or whatever, you can get your radical dog. reviews here with the Radical Reviewer. Thanks for watching. Life is beautiful, really it is, full of beauty and illusions. Life is great, without it, you'd be dead. Donkey sure.